It made all the sense in the world why the WWE was trying to set out to make SummerSlam their WrestleMania of the summer. Yes! 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 You would think that this would have always been the attitude, uh, but at least they came to the realization of the error of their ways, and I guess at the end of the day, you could say better late than never, right? Yes! 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 So it would most certainly stand to reason that not only going with WrestleMania, part of the package now is the Raw after WrestleMania and the kind of crazy fun night that that ultimately is, that the WWE would try to do the same in kind with the Raw after SummerSlam. And I think most certainly all of us can agree that that would be a good thing. Yes! 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 While I don't necessarily think that this Raw after SummerSlam equal to a Raw after WrestleMania like we've seen over the past few years, I have to say I still found a way to really enjoy this show, have fun watching this show, and by God could I say this was one time that I found myself relatively entertained throughout the three hours of Raw. And I really think the opening segment set the tone for the night. People like to hear Paul Heyman talk. They got to hear Paul Heyman talk. People like to see Bo Dallas, and in particular Bo Dallas get his ass kicked. They got to see Bo Dallas, and they got to see Bo Dallas get his ass kicked. It's a good utilization of a guy that you're not otherwise using. People like to see Brock Lesnar smash. Brock smashed and smashed Bo Dallas repeatedly. In particular, people really like a non-authority promo segment kicking off the show. It was the fact that it was a little bit different from the status quo. It gave people so many elements that they really liked. It was a really effective way to kick off the night's proceedings. Oh, but that's wrong. Brock's mad because he did the Undertaker tap down, and that means he should have won the match at SummerSlam. Oh, boo fucking who? It was the tombstone thigh torture technique that he learned from his local dojo. And if you don't like it, you can EAT SHIT! You want vengeance. You want to take her one more time. You think you can actually beat the dead man? All I have to say to that is... <laughs> one of the major attractions with the Raw after WrestleMania is who's going to show up, who's going to debut, who's going to return. So you had to figure that if the WWE is going to try to make this a Raw after WrestleMania type of show, that you were going to get some of those elements. And while we didn't really get a lot in terms of debuts, you got one notable one, I would say you did get a couple of nice surprise returns, and the first one was the return of the Dudley Boys, for the record. I'm glad that that NYC crowd was behind the New Day. Xavier was playing the trombone was magnificent, people. God damn it, though. If I'm going to do the Big E. Big E, Big E, got to do the Big E. Big E, Big E, got to do the Big E. Big E, Big E. Got to do the biggie, biggie, biggie. Got to do the biggie, biggie, biggie. Got to do the biggie, biggie, biggie. Got to do the biggie. And I'm going to do the Kofi. Now I got to go buy a fucking trombone so that way I can do the Xavier Watts. This is bullshit. That costs money, damn it. But anyways. The Dudley Boys come back to a huge pop, and it's amazing to me that you can have a team like these guys just do a couple of things, and the place is absolutely going nuts. Wanda! You know, before the TNA fans sit there and say, well, how dare you? Well, they were in TNA. You sat there and shit all over them. Not true. What I shit all over was the fact that they were such a major part of an Aces and Eight storyline that was so god-awful and so completely terrible and that they were pushing Bully Ray basically as their top guy for an extended period of time. When they were a tag team in TNA, very good. One of the truly great tag teams in the history of the wrestling business. So I have absolutely no problem with the Dudley Boys coming back as a tag team because frankly, this WWE tag team division could use a veteran tag team, an accomplished tag team like the Dudley Boys. Could we possibly, for the love of humanity, get some type of story, some type of storyline out of this? 
The Dudley boys can carry a program. They can pull off a story. Let's give them something to work with. Let's give them something to sink their teeth into. And from my perspective, for my money, I would love nothing more than to see eventually down the road the Dudley Boys versus the Usos for the tag titles at WrestleMania. It would be one of those great kind of passing of the torch type of matches. It would give the Usos their big WrestleMania victory that they frankly haven't gotten yet. And it would be a big spotlight for the Dudley Boys and a tag team that frankly deserves it on a show that could obviously use it next year come WrestleMania. So the Dudley Boys being back in the WWE as a tag team in that role, I'm excited about it. A Wyatt family with only two members really doesn't work and frankly doesn't make a whole lot of sense whatsoever. Not much of a family if you're trying to present it as a, a big-time family, whatever the case might be. It is kind of a shame, though, that two years after Bray Wyatt's debut, he's basically in the same damn spot. And we're going back and doing the same damn crap. However, if you're going to do that, then you need to add another piece, another element into the mix for the chemistry to work. Now... I was wondering who they were going to have be the third member of the Wyatt family with Rowan out with an injury for a period of time. And I guess we got our answer. They turned to a former Rosebud who's now going to be a big Hulk and badass. Now, to be fair, other than the fact that at moments I looked at him, I'm like, damn, in a certain light, he almost looks like the Earthquake's son. I sat there and said, you know what? He would be the big, imposing type of motherfucker you would expect somebody like Bray Wyatt to want to have in his corner. I like how they presented him here. I like how they featured him here. I, in particular, really liked how they were going with him being the man of mystery. And they didn't know who the hell he was. And we didn't know his name. We didn't know anything about him. I'm like, great! Terrific! Let's do something different! Don't give him a fucking name! Don't tell us anything about him! He just stands there, looks big, hulking, and menacing, and semi-balding, and he beats the shit out of people. So, of course, later on in the night, they reveal his name to be fucking Braun Strowman. What the fuck type of name is that? Who the hell came up with that shit? I was so hoping that they weren't going to give him a name. He's going to be the big black sheep and Sister Abigail's greatest gift. Well, it doesn't need to have a freaking name. We'll see where they go with this, and we'll see... If they bring a third person into the fold on the side of Reigns and Ambrose. Um, but yeah, this guy's debuted. Certain parts of it were good. I just wish they would have kept that man of mystery element a little bit longer than about a freaking hour in the show. Braun Strowman. More like boring dead man. Nobody does that to my Romans. Nobody's. I'm going to assemble the deuces and fours. And we're coming for your ass at Night of Champions, you big, dumb, humpty, dumpty looking, bald headed ass. How dare you sit there and cheap shot my Romans and put them to sleep? Romans, if you need me, Deuces and Fours is there for you. Love yous. Love you, Romans. Call me. We're gonna get this motherfucker! Call me, Roman! Love yous! So, with the Divas and this whole Divas revolution, I will say that these young ladies can wrestle. It's refreshing to see women that are actually talented in the ring getting an opportunity with WWE. Yes! 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 One of my biggest complaints about this whole Divas Revolution is that as much as people try to pretend it's something different and fool themselves into thinking it's something different and are believing in the WWE when they're telling you it's something different, it's pretty much just been the same crap. It's just some different faces and maybe one extra match for the women. Other than that, it's always a match. It's some type of match, some type of match. So seeing these ladies, Team PCB, what a lame-ass name that was, get a talk segment, get featured on Miz TV, especially with somebody like The Miz, you know, I'm fine with that. Yes! 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 I just wish these women were a little easier on the eyes to look at. Just a little bit. Shows what he knows. I happen to think that all these divas are lovely and oh, so beautiful. But I really wish is that they could actually talk and or act. 
And I wish that you, Schleg Daddy, would shut the hell up! While The Miz is doing a great job of being a smarmy kind of piece of crap, a bit of a sexist pig, and it makes the segment kind of go, the segment was pretty bad. Let's call it as we see it. And of course, what does it lead to? Another tag match, which of course was so compelling and so interesting. While this is going on, the crowd is chanting for Sasha. We want Sasha. We want Sasha. Letting you know that yet again, that these are all stalling tactics, just so that way Nikki Bella can pass AJ Lee for longest, deepest title reign, and hopefully, mercifully, it'll be over. But ultimately, all of this up to this point in time, including what's going on with this Divas Revolution, is a huge, tremendous waste of time that is really serving no purpose other than the purpose that I've just stated. The only thing that is a waste of time and serves no purpose is clicking on this video and watching this asshat review Raw every week. I was wondering if Jon Stewart was actually going to make an appearance on Raw. I was wondering if the WWE was going to bother trying to explain what he did at SummerSlam and why he did it, when he did it, to who he did it. And I got my answer, I guess. You know, ultimately, this segment was designed to be that mainstream media attention getter. And that's what it was. His involvement at SummerSlam was a big mainstream media attention getter and obviously his appearance again here on Raw was designed to do exactly what it did. Get the company a lot of mainstream attention. And one thing I will say to the credit of the WWE, while their relevance in a lot of ways is not all that particularly high at this time and the overall interest in their product is nowhere near an all-time high, you look at some of the ways they're able to get coverage now and get attention and get mainstream exposure. They do almost as good of a job as they have in a long period of time. I mean, you've got John Cena appearing on the Today Show and all of these different things. You've got everybody talking about John Stewart's appearance at SummerSlam. You've got ESPN going to SummerSlam. You've got ESPN talking about SummerSlam. You've got Brock Lesnar appearing on SportsCenter. I mean, this company's getting a lot of mainstream attention, even if it's not necessarily bearing fruits in terms of the weekly ratings, as is the case with this week's show, which I thought was pretty good, had a lot of things going for it. But again, you're going up against Monday Night Football preseason or not, the rating is not all that strong. So we get to this segment, though. Again, designed to do exactly what it did. You get Jon Stewart. You throw in John Cena, you sprinkle in a little bit of Ric Flair, and you've got some decent television, you would hope. Now, I will say, I was wondering what type of reason or rationale or justification John Stewart was going to have for what he did at SummerSlam. And honestly, honestly, you might sit there and say, well, he just kind of came up with it, and they just threw it against the wall and hoped it stuck. It did stick. It made sense. And in fact, it made a lot of sense. And if we were, if we, if we look at it from this perspective... If we were in that position and we had that type of opportunity, that type of chance, we probably would have done the same thing that Jon Stewart would have done to protect Ric Flair's record and keep John Cena from tying it. We wouldn't have quite acted like the whiny little apologetic bitch that Stewart did during this segment. I didn't particularly like that. You know, I would have liked Stewart to be a little more funny, a little less worry and whiny. Uh, but he was playing his role nonetheless, and although, it's just again, the reasons made sense. It worked for me. It clicked for me. I'm like, you know what? That makes sense. I just wish they would utilize Flair a little differently, and in particular, they wouldn't always have Flair come on and be such a John Cena fan and such a John Cena apologist. You know, you can sit there and talk about records are made to be broken, but at the end of the day, you really don't want your fucking record to be broken. So does anyone believe in any way, shape, or form that in the real world that Ric Flair would actually want John Cena to tie him and surpass his record for world championships? The answer is absolutely freaking no. And for me, with John Cena being in the position that he's in, and Ric Flair being who Ric Flair is, you could make an entire angle out of this that could carry you for a freaking year. Flair keeps aligning himself with people that ultimately their job is to prevent John Cena from winning the WWE World Heavyweight Championship to prevent him from tying Ric Flair's record. To me, that would make a whole lot of sense. But uh, that's too layered and too intricate and too much for the WWE, obviously, to want to put together and pull off. But that's a way I would envision use, utilizing a Ric Flair that would help Ric Flair, would help John Cena, and create some interesting television. But in terms of what Cena did here, 
You know, Cena's pissed. Cena's angry. He should be. While he came across as heelish, I say no more heelish or villainish or bullyish than he usually does. It's understandable here. It's believable here. It makes sense here. And this segment worked because Jon Stewart made a sound, logical argument for why he did what he did. And while I wasn't, I was greatly happy to see Ric Flair, even though he seemed somewhat sober, which brought down the segment a little bit. I wish he would have been utilized differently and be saying some different things. John Cena acted exactly the way we probably would in that fucking situation. This guy screwed you. I'm going to get him back. That's human fucking nature. For once, a good Cena segment. I know the WWE was trying to set out to give us a really exciting eight-man tag, that kind of co-main event to Raw. I get it. And I applaud the effort, but at the end of the day, this to me was just a bridge to the gap to get me to the main event the whole time. I'm just like, I want to get to the main event. I want to see what they're going to do. I want to see how this show closes. I could give a shit less about this match. At least they had Owens and Rusev act like they should, especially once the match was over. They're acting like heels. They're fighting with other heels. Good. I'm fine with that. I'm just wondering who the hell Big Show pissed off. They, they went out of their way to make the end of this whole match, this whole segment of the show, about Big Show getting his comeuppance multiple times. Let's hope to God this isn't leading to a Big Show face turn, mind you. But it was just interesting. Like the, the heels hate Big Show. The faces hate Big Show. It's like Big Show took a dump in Vince's toilet, and now he's getting vengeance. <laughs> Now, the whole night, the big story was following up at what had been set up before SummerSlam. That is, if Seth Rollins beats John Cena, they're going to make a statue out of him, and he's going to go alongside the likes of Andre the Giant and the Ultimate Warrior and Bruno Sammartino and all of this. So you're building up the whole night to this main event, even though we had already seen that statue earlier on in the night, it lets you know probably that something was up, something was going to happen, you were at least hoping and anticipating. Now, we sit there and it's going to be an authority segment closing out the night. We don't get it at the beginning, we get it at the end. I kind of, in a way, thought this was just going to be another lame-ass raw finish that would really bring me down from what was, for the most part, a good, enjoyable night of watching WWE. That's what I anticipated. That's what I expected. Based off the way it was being set up, that's what I thought was going to happen. Especially when they had John Cena confront Stephanie and Hunter backstage. And you've got two guys that are both smaller and not as strong and not as swole as Cena leading him away with his arms behind his back but no handcuffs. I know I can't be the only one that called bullshit on that. I know I can't be the only one that thought that was absolutely not believable in any way, shape, or form. Of all the things John Cena has plowed through over the years, of all the things John Cena has been able to overcome over the years, of all the people John Cena has destroyed and blown through, now you're telling me two unnamed security guys who happen to be not as strong as him are going to lead him away. He's going to actually exit the building and not in handcuffs. I called bullshit on that. And that's why I really thought this finish was going to be lame as fuck because I thought Cena was going to be the one that they would reveal when they pulled up the curtain. He's going to be there and he's going to get one over on Rollins. Da, 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 da. Well, thank God that didn't happen. The WWE went in a different direction. And oh, baby, what a moment. You pull up the curtain and there's the man called Sting. It's about time we saw him again. I was frankly hoping he was going to be involved with SummerSlam because I thought the show would have been able to utilize a sting. And I felt, feel, especially based off of the way he performed at WrestleMania, that if he wants to work a couple of other big matches at big shows throughout the year, he should be allowed to do so. He's earned that right based off of his reputation and obviously based off of the way he's taking getting himself in condition and shape so seriously. Wish he would have done that for TNA, a company that was so good to him for so many years, frankly. But it is what it is. Now, I know what the TNA fans are going to say about this segment, and I will address that in another video. This is not the moment or the time for this. The bottom line is, is I finally got something at the end of the show that really made me want to tune into next week's show to see what the fuck is going to happen. This is the type of suspense-filled, awesome finish that actually leaves you wanting more. 
This is the type of gratifying, satisfying, yet some ways as well unfulfilling, you want more type of finish that makes you want to watch next week's show, makes you eagerly anticipate next week's show. This was a great finish to the show. It came off so well to me. It makes so much sense from a storyline standpoint. It would have been nice if you were going to do this and send them at Rollins and perhaps the title that you're going to sit there and I don't know, maybe actually have him beat Hunter at WrestleMania, damn it. Why is Hunter sitting there backing away from the dude that he fucking beat at WrestleMania? That made no sense to me. But the storyline of him fucking over Rollins and the authority at Survivor Series last year, the shit that happened at WrestleMania with Triple H, it makes sense now that he would want to come after Rollins and the freaking title. And also look at it from a positive standpoint, too, of the sense that this is a statement for Seth Rollins as well. Sting's first ever WWE match was at WrestleMania against Triple H. Sting's second ever match in the WWE is going to be against Seth Rollins at Night of Champions, most likely in the main event, for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. Well, I haven't been a big, huge fan of Seth Rollins' title reign, and I, in particular, haven't been a big fan of the way he's been featured. This has to be some type of positive statement that says that that company trusts him enough and believes him enough to give him this type of spot against this type of opponent at this particular time. I love the finish to the show. I popped like shit when I saw Sting. I'm like, yeah, you damn right. I'm happy to see Sting go after Seth Rollins because... I want him to become the WWE World Heavyweight Champion. Stick that in your fucking pipe and smoke. <laughs>